So uh, uh, my name is Seker Tatikunda, and uh, I've been asked to uh, start, I guess this is session three. We have uh, two speakers. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Leandros Tesoulis in the blue. Uh, a little bit about him. He's a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Yale. And his research uh, interests include uh, computer and communication networks, uh, with an emphasis on uh, developing models and algorithms for complex networks, uh, architectures and protocols for wireless systems, as well as exploring sensor networks and novel internet architectures. In addition, he has a, a rather vast experimental platform for, for conducting his research. Uh, Leandros joined Yale about four weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so he's brand new, and I think he's still unpacking boxes. <laughs> so welcome. Our next speaker is uh, Peter Schott. He's a professor of economics at the Yale School of Management. He's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a special sworn status researcher at the U.S. Census Bureau. And his research focuses on how countries, firms, and workers respond to globalization. He joined Yale in 1999, so I'm guessing most of his boxes are unpacked by now. So, so welcome, Leandros. Thank you. Thank you, Shakar. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, glad to be here and uh, have the opportunity to give this talk. Um, the flavor of my talk uh, will be a bit uh, different than what we have heard until now. Um, our uh, research is focused on uh, communication networks, that is, on uh, how to manage the transport of data from uh, where they are generated to the users. And uh, I'll present uh, a few problems uh, related uh, to current uh, challenges for uh, mobile networking and uh, how we address them. So uh, we'll start with uh, some uh, background and uh, motivation of what you will hear. And the motivation is uh, the explosion of uh, mobile data the last uh, uh, few years. And uh, the diagram here uh, shows that. And as we see, the main reason for um, the data, the mobile data explosion is essentially the smartphones and uh, all the videos that uh, uh, either streamed to the mobile user or they are recorded and uh, uploaded by the user. Uh, so this is uh, some current data, uh, the 2012, 13, and uh, 14, and some uh, projected uh, um, numbers for the data growth as uh, they are uh, uh, predicted by a study performed by Cisco. So we see that uh, there is uh, an average annual growth of uh, 66%. And uh, as we'll see in the next uh, slide, that is much faster than uh, the mobile network capacity is growing. Um, the capacity of uh, the mobile network uh, is growing uh, for, uh, uh, by various actions of uh, the operators. First, uh, there is uh, some increase on uh, the available licensed bandwidth. Then uh, there is a continuous additional deployment of uh, new cell sites. And uh, there are improvements of uh, the wireless technology itself that allows to push more bits per hertz. Now, uh, all this adds up to an uh, average uh, annual growth that is of the order of uh, 29%, that is uh, far behind than uh, the increase in mobile data. So uh, uh, that stresses the mobile operators quite a bit, and they, are look, they look to all kinds of uh, alternatives uh, to deal with this explosion. Of course, there are uh, developments on the wireless technology itself. Currently, um, uh, we are uh, using um, 4G networks based on the LTE technology. Um, and there is underway uh, research for the next uh, generation of uh, uh, mobile wireless technology, what is called the 5G technology, but this will take a while, it's a technology that uh, um, will be based on the 60 gigahertz uh, band and will provide um, 
a very significant uh, increase of the capacity. But until then, and this will take um, a few years at least, uh, there is an urgent need uh, to deal with um, the, inc the increasing demand for uh, capacity. And uh, I'll present uh, three approaches we have uh, considered uh, recently uh, for uh, dealing with this problem. And the first one is uh, what we call data offloading. What do we mean by data offloading? Uh, typically, mobile uh, services are provided by uh, cellular base stations owned by the mobile operators that operate in uh, the license spectrum, which is licensed to the different operators. Now, in addition to those, there is uh, a proliferation of uh, other means for wireless access, more specifically the Wi-Fi access points, which are omnipresent nowadays. And they can be of three kinds, uh, the residential access points owned by individuals, uh, enterprise access points, uh, as well as uh, access points deployed by different kind of operators which are provided for service to the users. Now, uh, these access points uh, operate in uh, an unlicensed uh, spectrum band, and uh, they are much uh, cheaper in many ways than uh, uh, wireless access through the license spectrum to the cellular operator websites. So, um, one approach for uh, dealing with the increase in the capacity is uh, to try to use, uh, to use to the extent possible uh, these other means for wireless access, that is uh, access points and femtocells, and uh, offload a bit um, the cellular base stations. Um, now this offloading is happening in many ways. Uh, for instance, the mobile operator themselves uh, deploy their own uh, access point networks, and perhaps you have uh, seen some of it uh, already moving around. For instance, AT&T has uh, deployed uh, 32,000 Wi-Fi hotspots, that is 32,000 uh, access points, uh, primarily in uh, heavy traffic areas. Uh, in addition, there are... Uh, other companies like uh, Phone, uh, who have uh, their own uh, deployed uh, access point network. Now, uh, besides those, the vast majority of access points we see, they are uh, uh, residential access points or enterprise access points owned by individual entities. And uh, the big opportunity will be if there is an effective way to... Uh, exploit the available capacity of those access points for offloading. Uh, what do we mean? Uh, if you turn on uh, your uh, Wi-Fi interface of uh, your uh, smartphone, wherever you are, you will see uh, typically at least a dozen, a dozen or more uh, networks available, but they are all locked uh, because they belong to individuals. If there is a way to make them available somehow uh, to you and uh, have the mobile operator save the capacity by directing you to those access points instead of serving you directly, that will be a big game for them. And uh, we studied uh, some ways to do that. And uh, we came up with uh, a method that uh, essentially views this interaction of uh, the access points and uh, the different mobile operator, uh, operators as a market, uh, where the operators uh, try to buy, in some sense, services by the access points. And the access points uh, try to benefit somehow by the fact that they offer their capacity to the operators to uh, redirect their traffic. So in a typical scenario, we may have uh, a number of uh, cell site antennas belonging uh, to dif different mobile operators, and uh, they 
operate in the same area with a number of access points, uh, each access point belonging to different individuals. Uh, now, uh, each uh, cell site, from uh, a technical point of view, may uh, redirect uh, their uh, mobile users to a number of access points who are within reach. And, uh, uh, and the, the, at the same time, each access point may provide uh, the, uh, this kind of service to different cell sites in the sense that uh, it may serve uh, uh, mobile users from different operators. And uh, the question is, what is uh, an effective way of assigning uh, access points to mobile operators? Uh, effective from two points of view. One point of view is uh, to do the optimal allocation of mobile uh, users to uh, access points and uh, offload, let's say, cell sites which are uh, heavily utilized and uh, they are uh, in capacity and they cannot uh, serve adequately their users. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, satisfy other uh, efficiency indicators, like for instance, uh, try to offload mobile users which are at the periphery of the cell of uh, a cellular operator because those users are most uh, costly in serving them, both uh, in terms of consumed bandwidth and energy. Uh, now, at the same time, uh, the access points should, ha should have some uh, uh, incentives for providing their excess capacity, even though it is uh, free for them. Uh, the fact that they are providing should give uh, back some benefits. So uh, these incentives should be somehow uh, proportional uh, to the benefit they will offer to the mobile operators. And the best way to do that is to create a market. Now, uh, it turned out that some uh, uh, more traditional ways for doing that, like uh, different types of auctions, uh, like the VCG auction or the McAfee auction, uh, are not efficient for that particular case because uh, they, they will require, in general, an intermediate broker that may need uh, to invest in the market, that is to put uh, uh, money or some kind of utility in the market. And the best way to do that was uh, to use uh, uh, a double auction, uh, which is an extension of uh, a Kelly mechanism for uh, the network utility maximization. So we came up uh, with uh, a setting for this uh, double auction where uh, both uh, the mobile network operators and the access points are used as, uh, are viewed as bidders and uh, they bid based on uh, the price, on some uh, prices offered by uh, an intermediate broker. Now it turned out that uh, the scheme uh, was effective, oops, skip this, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it is uh, amenable to a distributed implementation through an intermediate broker that uh, emits, uh, let's say, scalar signals uh, and allows an iterative exchange of bids between uh, the participating bidders. And uh, it turned out that uh, uh, it converges to some uh, uh, allocation of uh, access points to uh, cell sites, which is socially optimal, socially optimal with respect to the utility functions which are selected. Now, uh, by a careful selection of the utility function, both from the side of the mobile network operator and the access point, uh, this uh, double auction mechanism uh, may converge to a different, um, let's say, equilibrium points. And uh, the challenge for uh, the designer is to select those uh, utility functions appropriately. Now, um, I'll skip to this kept us busy um, the last couple of years, as you see, for the related publications. I'll skip um, to the second uh, setting, just to give you a flavor. 
Um, I'll skip a few, a few, fly, a few slides. Uh, I would just uh, um, would like to let you know that uh, in uh, a week time, in October 8, I'll give uh, the same presentation, the full version, one hour of it in the Yin seminar. So if you got interested from what you hear today, you are welcome uh, on October 8 in the Yin seminar. So, um, a second problem we considered is what is called the user-provided network. And it is, uh, uh, we try to address the same challenge from, but from a different way. That is, uh, uh, instead of uh, leaving uh, the game of capacity to the cellular operators that try to capture access points, we view uh, the mobile user itself as uh, uh, a potential network provider. Uh, that is, uh, the smartphone that the user carries may act uh, both as a, a gateway to the internet as well as uh, a relay to the user. And uh, by having uh, uh, the users assume those three different roles, that is uh, uh, consumers of service or relay or gateway in an appropriate way, they may provide service to each other uh, without uh, uh, with being transparent to the network. And the question is uh, how to do this effectively by mimicking uh, schemes that uh, have been adopted in uh, other domains for a similar purpose. For instance, uh, um, the Airbnb is an example, right, of uh, a similar type of um, uh, interaction, but in a different domain. Now, uh, some uh, recent advantages in networking, like the software-defined uh, networks which are available today, uh, provide all the technical flexibility for adopting such schemes and implementing them. Let me give you some uh, examples of how such a scheme will work and what are the challenges. Uh, here, for instance, we see uh, three smartphone uh, carriers uh, in the first picture that uh, uh, may act either as uh, consumers of service, uh, which is the client here, or as uh, intermediates for uh, providing uh, connection to the internet. Uh, so uh, the two smartphones which are labeled gateways, they have a direct connection to the internet, one through uh, a cellular connection and the other through a Wi-Fi connection. And uh, the third user benefits uh, from their own internet connection to have uh, 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 to have uh, his own uh, internet connectivity through them. Uh, in the second picture, uh, we have uh, a two-hop SAT scheme where uh, the client smartphone accesses the, in the internet through a two-hop connection to the smartphone that has uh, a direct access to the internet through... Um, uh, through his uh, cell connection. And uh, in the other two pictures, we see two other scenarios of such uh, role exchange between relay and the gateway, uh, which have uh, some uh, uh, eff uh, which have uh, which, uh, which provide uh, eventual uh, internet connectivity to the final client. Now, uh, as uh, a network evolves and the smartphones move around, their connections, uh, their direct connections to the internet change, both in terms of availability or quality. So different potential scenarios of clients, relays, and gateways become possible. And uh, the question is, uh, which scenario will be adopted each time such that uh, the internet connectivity is efficient in terms of uh, speed and energy consumption. And uh, it's also fair, fair in the sense that uh, 
each user take its turn serving the other user and uh, we don't end up in schemes where some users always act as gateways providing both capacity and energy for internet connectivity while other users uh, always benefit by uh, having internet connectivity as clients without uh, spending money from their own uh, cellular connection or energy. And uh, we came up with uh, a scheme to do that. Um, I will just um, mention some uh, highlights of the scheme. First, uh, the scheme is based on uh, the NAS bargaining solution as the underlying conceptual framework for exchange of services. It employs some uh, virtual currency uh, to deal with uh, uh, to deal with the problem that uh, at different uh, time instances, time instances, different users have uh, different uh, uh, quality of internet connections, and uh, they pro they can provide service or obtain service. And uh, furthermore, uh, the NASBAR gaining solution in that particular case. Um, naturally provides uh, a distributed means for uh, implementing it and uh, keeping track of uh, which users have benefit for uh, how much time and how much uh, each user owes to the other for the future. So uh, it turned out that uh, uh, this scheme works uh, well and um, I'll just want to show you something here. And uh, it turns out that it fits well with uh, a very um, uh, recent framework that uh, is available by Open Garden, which provides a technology for doing that. And uh, the credit scheme we proposed, uh, it can be adopted by the Open Garden framework for uh, regulating the user access. So uh, I'll take just a few minutes to say a few words about the third problem, which again tries to address uh, the same challenge from a different viewpoint. Now, uh, the viewpoint is the following. Um, again, we need to deal with uh, the rapid capacity uh, demand, the increase of uh, the capacity demand. Uh, and this is a problem that is faced by the mobile operator itself. That is, the mobile operator, uh, in its effort to increase the infrastructure capacity, it uh, deploys uh, cell sites of uh, different nature. That is, uh, some are uh, uh, large cells, some are uh, micro cells or pico cells in the sense of the cells uh, with a periphery of a few 10 meters. Uh, but this uh, requires uh, an excessive infrastructure for connecting all those cells to the internet. And uh, a problem then is that uh, a bottleneck is created on how all these cells will be connected to the wired infrastructure. So a method uh, to deal with this bo uh, bottleneck is again an implicit one uh, th that takes advantage of the fact that uh, a lot of traffic nowadays, especially uh, downlink traffic from the network to the user, uh, is repetitive. That is, a large number of users are seeing the same video or uh, a large number of users in the same location access the same data. So uh, uh, a natural way to deal with it is uh, to add storage at uh, different stages of the network and in particular close to uh, the base station itself. So uh, novel uh, mobile network architectures have storage at uh, all these different uh, levels and the challenge is uh, how to effectively use this storage that is uh, what traffic we should store at each particular uh, uh, storage cache that is available at different uh, uh, parts of the network now uh, in order to 
evaluate this, uh, there is a number of considerations. One is uh, the likelihood that a certain piece of information will be needed at uh, a particular point of the network. And uh, this can be predicted to a large extent uh, by considering uh, the social network structure of the mobile users, that is the characteristics of uh, uh, the access characteristics of uh, the friends, let's say, of a specific user. Uh, another consideration is uh, the service cost of uh, the different connections, that is, uh, certain links are more expensive than others, and I uh, would like to use those uh, as little as possible, and that uh, um, somehow influences the kind of uh, data that uh, will store in the caches uh, that uh, uh, offload those links. And uh, another consideration is uh, the service policy itself, that is, uh, we need uh, to give a priority. Um, I mean, certain uh, types of data have priority over the others, and uh, those should be given priority in storage in the local caches as well. So um, all these considerations should be taken into account in uh, determining uh, in determining essentially whether a piece of data that is delivered to a user will be kept at the local storage of uh, the base station at the same time or will, be, or will just be uh, neglected. So uh, we studied this problem and we came up with uh, some, uh, uh, some strategy for determining whether a certain piece of information should be kept in each cache. And uh, this strategy is uh, the result of the solution of uh, an optimization problem. Uh, the challenge was uh, how to make this uh, strategy simple to implement uh, such that it is attractive to a mobile operator since uh, the direct solution of uh, the optimization problem uh, was uh, not amenable for uh, an easy implementation of the mobile operator. So, uh, we looked in uh, some uh, uh, approximation uh, methods to the optimal strategy that uh, made possible uh, an efficient implementation by the mobile operator. So uh, I think I'll um, stop here. I just wanted to give you a flavor of uh, the type of uh, work we are doing and how it is uh, maybe remotely connected to uh, the, uh, the data problems, uh, the data issues you have seen in previous talks. And um, I will be available for any questions you may have later. Okay, uh, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, again, as, I guess a different kind of presentation. This is more about um, data that's gonna become available, not my own data, but data that's gonna become available here at Yale through a, uh, what's known as a research data center. Um, so I thought, uh, uh, when you use census data, every presentation you do has to have one of these, so I thought even though there's nothing in it that's using census data, I would put one of these up. Um, you have to put up one of these disclaimers all the time. Uh, so I would, thought I would take you very briefly kind of through um, uh, what RDCs are, what you might get out of them, and why um, uh, they're about to be a lot easier to use uh, for YALEs than they uh, were before. Um, so what is an RDC? An RDC is a research data center. Um, the U.S. Census Bureau and increasingly a lot of other agencies um, in the U.S. government um, have been placing data available, uh, uh, what administrative or survey data available 
um, for the use by for use by researchers. And um, these data are actually never leave uh, Sweetland, Maryland, which is where all the servers are. Um, but increasingly, the census is allowing uh, centers to pop up around the country, um, which point to those data. Um, so a research data center is a physical location outside of the Census Bureau that uh, allows one to access census uh, data, as well as uh, census is now taking on the role of archiving data from other agencies. Um, and uh, not just anyone can walk in, they're highly secure locations, um, uh, multiple passwords and IDs to get in. Um, but uh, researchers who can become qualified users of the data are allowed access uh, to these data. And the great thing about an RDC is uh, they're open 24-7, 365. So you, with access, you can go in whenever you want. Um, so that's what an RDC is. Uh, what kinds of data does an RDC contain? So there's a really broad range um, of information available. Most of the data, I'm most familiar with the data uh, in the first um, uh, bullet there and as an economist using a lot of the economic data. Um, but think of anything you know of that census collects, uh, the people census, the business census, uh, demographic data, lots of different surveys. Um, these data are made available inside an RDC at the level at which they're collected. So public data sets might summarize, for example, the number of firms that exist in an industry. Um, the economic census, if you access it through an RDC, allows you to see the uh, align the data for every uh, establishment of every firm that reported information. Um, so tremendous, uh, tremendously useful data for certain kinds of uh, research. Um, and then there's uh, similar kinds of data available for demographers, for um, healthcare, et cetera. Um, so I'm not going to go through the data sets, but um, they're re relatively easy to find a list of which data sets are available and kind of the variables that they contain. Actually, I should say the <laughs> one of the interesting things about the census is what's available publicly and what's not. So actually, I think the variable names actually are not disclosable. So one of the funny things about writing a proposal is you have to say what data you want to use without actually having the list of the variables that are available. And the way you kind of get over that hurdle is you work closely with the uh, administrator of an RDC who kind of coaches you along about the data that might be available. Um, so for example, if you click on one of these data sets, it wouldn't tell you all the variables in there. It would kind of give an overview of what information is contained in that data set. Um, so that's what an RDC is. How did Yale get an RDC? Uh, so right, the green dots on this map here are uh, the locations of all of the current RDCs. Census began, uh, originally there was just one RDC. It was at Census uh, around the time that I was on the job market in 1999. That was the only place pretty much you could access these data. Um, since then, uh, census has been building out this network. You can see it kind of roughly corresponds to concentrations of academics around the country. Um, and Census is interested in building out this network even more. Um, uh, and an RDC is a main uh, kind of uh, uh, center for accessing the data. Census, as part of its model of expansion, has also been allowing uh, branches to be established under an existing RDC. Yale has been a member since 2006 of the consortium that founded the New York Research Data Center. Uh, Princeton's in that, Columbia's in that, the Fed is in that. Um, that's located in Baruch College. Uh, so currently, I go down to New York once a week to use the data there. Um, uh, we applied uh, successfully to become a branch of the New York RDC in New Haven. There's another branch of the New York RDC in Cornell. Um, and uh, with generous funding from Kohl's, we're going to have this branch RDC show up on Hill House in one of the econ department buildings. Um, it's, if you, if you, uh, the cost is about $200,000 to set up this branch. That's mostly due to um, the costs within Yale of making the space secure. Um, and then about 50,000 chunk of it is IT equipment that we get from Yale. Servers, that, I mean, uh, dumb terminals that kind of point back to um, Washington. Um, the floor plan, uh, I'm not sure how interested you are in the floor plan, but the thing is the center looks like this. The top of it is an, an office for the administrator that has to oversee the branch. And then that bigger room is a space with six terminals. Um, six terminals, depending on whether you've done stuff like this before, may seem like a lot or a little. Uh, the New York office has uh, eight terminals. And I go down there. I've almost never seen it full. We're hoping that six will be a pretty good number. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, the key thing to realize, if you don't really know it, is that since Yale is a member of an RDC consortium, anyone at Yale actually can access the data uh, for free, uh, given that we're already paying the dues for that. And that'll be true for the branch as well. So really, the only cost for the user is to kind of get a proposal approved by the Census Bureau. 
Um, by the way, I wanted to put this slide in. We need an administrator. Um, and so if you have any ideas uh, uh, around the room, please let me know or Sandra Greer know. Uh, our administrator, the, the administrator of a typical RDC is a relatively senior fellow. Usually it's a PhD. The one in New York is a PhD in economics, for example. Um, we only need a junior administrator, someone working 20 hours a week. Um, the hitch is that uh, that person who is the administrator has to be an a census employee. They, they're not going to be a Yale employee. And so the way this works is we're looking around campus for someone that might be interested in this job. Uh, it's 20 hours a week. It's very flexible. Most of the time you don't have to do much. Um, uh, um, and the way it'll work is we'll identify a candidate hopefully within the next month or two. And then we specify the parameters of that individual and give those parameters to census. And then census hires that person after a search for that individual. Um, uh, and then that person becomes a regular census employee and is on an employee track uh, within census. Um, so any ideas would be very welcome. Um, so that was my little pitch for an um, administrator. OK, uh, now you know what an RDC is. How can you get access to an RDC? Um, as I said, these are proprietary data. They're governed by a whole host of laws, which if you get access, you have to learn about the laws and all the ways you can be punished by violating them. Um, so I won't bore you with all those details, but it's, it's restricted by law. And one of the things that you may not be that familiar with, but which is an integral part of getting access to census data, is your, your research proposal not only has to have the usual intellectual merit, the census propo the proposed research also has to have a benefit for census. And the reason for that is, by law, census can only kind of provide access to these data if they're in a part of an effort to improve the quality of the data at census. And so when one writes an a proposal for research at the Census Bureau, a big part of what you write in your, well, a big in terms of um, importance, not so big in terms of words, uh, part of the proposal that you write is how you're going to benefit the Census Bureau. Um, and they have these great quotes on their website about this. Uh, and they're, they're quite, I mean, listening to the presentations today, um, they, they should sound very familiar. Uh, you know, Census collects all of this information, and one of the best ways to figure out if the information is correct and makes sense um, is to give it to users and see what they find. And uh, if you have proposed research, you'll be using the data uh, and in part checking the quality of the data because of all the things that you're looking for. Um, and so they take that, um, that's taken pretty seriously. Um, and I should say it's not that hard to uh, come up with ways to um, improve uh, census's data to put into proposal. And again, when one develops a proposal in conjunction with the administrator of an RDC, uh, they guide you along in terms of how to word this. Um, okay. And then, uh, then there's the normal, the rest of the bullet points there are the normal uh, criteria. Another consideration uh, is the, again, I said the major cost of getting involved with census data is actually getting the access. And this varies. The time it takes from kind of deciding you want to start working on a proposal uh, to getting the proposal approved and then getting your security clearance for using the data, which isn't that onerous but is a step. Um, it takes about a year. That, that can sometimes get longer. That sometimes gets shorter depending upon staffing and how things are going in DC and whether there's a budget crisis, et cetera. Um, but think about a year, uh, half a year to a year to get access. Um, if you want more information, I put these up. Uh, if you want more information, you just Google Center for Economic Studies Census Bureau and you'll get all these websites. Um, they'll describe all of these data sets. Okay, that's mostly what I was going to go through. Uh, I have appendix slides if you want to know more, but I figured I would leave that for questions either in this forum or you can come up afterwards or send me an email or something and I'm happy to uh, give you more info. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Do you provide access to high-performance computing form of Yale at the same time on the same stations to use? I mean, for analytics to uh, run application to execute on different yes. analytics. Do you have? Do you provide uh, access to high-performance computing on the same stations in order not to copy data or s such a thing? So uh, all of the IT infrastructure is provided at Census, and uh, so they have uh, the server network and all the software that is most often used, you know, Stata, MATLAB, whatever. 
Um, I wouldn't characterize it as a high-speed computing network, and there's no way to kind of take the data from where they are. So, it, you, you know, you're kind of using the, the IT infrastructure that they have, and you're actually using it on the networks that are holding the copies so of the data. So what sort of, uh, you know, high-performance computing farm do they provide? Uh, the Census Bureau, I mean. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the technical details. It's kind of, I think, a standard Unix type setup. It's not one that's hyper, you know, like the high-speed clusters that we, I yeah, think because it's not like that. data without analysis ability. I mean, they could always add that. I think if there were enough demand to, to, to do that, they would add it. Um, right now, it seems to be pretty adequate. I mean, given the, I've been doing research there for like 10 years, it seems pretty adequate for the, the demands that I've had. OK, thank you. Yeah. Follow-up question: <laughs> How big is this data? Oh, um, uh, okay. So there are I can tell you the data sets I know. The, there are five and a half million private establishments in the United States. Um, so one of the data one of the data sets, the LBD, which tracks all private establishments in the United States, has about five million observations. You know, and then a whole bunch of fields for that observation across years, go back to 1977. So data sets range. The data sets I work with about a gigabyte or so when you put things together. Um, no problem kind of manipulating those data sets. I think uh, you can't always do that, for example, in one statistical package, but you could always move to SAS or something if it gets onerous. So is uh, that kind of... Excuse me, yeah. again, a follow-up. Uh, so um, you mentioned that yeah, yeah, they provide this AHRQ data, which is HCOP data for uh, probably all of these states. Yeah. And just for one state, California, HCOP data that I'm working with, yeah, one of the three databases it gets like uh, seven gigabytes for just four, four years, five yeah. years. So for the entire United States, it should be like more than 100 gigabytes or 300 gigabytes. I, I don't know, but so I've pe I've seen people running jobs where they, for example, you, to the extent that I can see the memory being pulled, it's like 150, 200 gigabytes that they're using uh, for those projects. They run those projects. I'm still doing my project, which is smaller, and it seems to work relatively I fine. I mean, I've never used that stuff, so maybe those, you know, there are researchers at Yale who are using those data set, I think, in public health. I'm not sure where you are. And so they might know better, for example, what, the, what that experience is like when they put all those things in one file or try to manipulate them. So we are in our uh, Center for Outcome Research and Evaluation, and we obtain data by uh, directly from uh, a HRQ hmm. organization. Uh, so I don't know much about the medical data, but I, uh, I mean, so I don't, I can't characterize what's there, and I can't characterize the user experience. But um, I could find out more, or point you to where to find out more if you need to. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I have a quick question about the restricted data and what you can uh, what you can do with it, if anything, outside the terminals that you were talking about. So, does all the analysis happen at the terminals, or is there a certain point in the process of analyzing the data where it is anonymized enough that you can, you know, take it on a flash drive and do your own work with it? Um, so the way it works is anything that they've figured out how to anonymize, they usually make into some kind of public use data set. Um, the way it works is all your analysis, uh, which is not anonymized, you can work with at the census. And then you have to, um, any results of that analysis that you want to take out, but not the data, you can't take the data out, have to pass disclosure. The rules for disclosure themselves are not disclosable. So... Um, <laughs> But uh, to give you a sense of, you know, if I run regressions of how firms have reacted to something, I, you basically have to not be able to in any way identify a single firm. So if you're doing the kind of high-level stuff that I do, it's never really an issue. The, the users that run into issues are if you want to kind of summarize things happening at the census block level or something where there might be like a few people living there. That's an issue. So the basic rule is you do your analysis there, and then you present results in an aggregate enough way that you can pass disclosure. So regressions and regression coefficients are usually fine. That goes, you hand those in along with a disclosure report and any analysis of why it doesn't violate disclosure. It goes to a disclosure review board. They bless it or they don't. If they bless it, they send you the stuff. And then think of that as getting a bunch of regression tables in the mail, like in Excel or something like that, in email. Yeah. Great, thanks.
Hi, so Leandros, I have a question for you about, uh, so you're in the Department of Electrical Engineering, but you're a YINS affiliate. And what we understand YINS is doing, what we've heard presentations last year at the Day of Data was a lot about human social networks. So how do the sensor networks that you're talking about sort of relate to that? Is it really transferable? Like the network of a sensor is the same as the network of a person. Or are you going to be working more on human social networks too? So what are you going to do at YINS? Uh, well, um, I think it, it happens in many levels. First, uh, at uh, the abstract levels, uh, the, the models, uh, the network models for um, the interaction of humans in social networks and uh, the network models for interaction, let's say, of wireless devices have um, a lot of common aspects. Um, for instance, the questions of how they scale and uh, what are uh, the attributes that affect uh, the scaling uh, are uh, answered by the same mathematics, essentially. So the, the abstract models are uh, similar. Uh, the other is that um, there is uh, a lot of interaction between the two uh, in uh, uh, the real world as well. For instance, um, a current trend in wireless networks that is uh, cognitive uh, radio, as it is called, which is uh, which tries to find very uh, effective ways for using uh, the radio spectrum, uh, taking into consideration interdependencies between the different devices. Uh, can um, exploit uh, a lot of input that is generated from the social network. That is, uh, relationships of uh, people as uh, they uh, can be deduced from the social network, they, uh, they can provide uh, uh, information on uh, how likely it is uh, one to try to access uh, the radio spectrum at the same time with somebody else. And this is information that is uh, very useful for uh, the design of uh, the radio access protocol itself. So this is just uh, two examples of uh, how the two are um, related. And uh, not only those two, uh, for instance, the presentation we have seen earlier by Mark Gerstein uh, pointed to, uh, to some other uh, uh, attributes uh, which uh, relate uh, the networks that uh, appear in the genomic uh, in the um, genomes with uh, the network the networking structures that uh, capture either the social networks or uh, the communication networks. So uh, I think that's. A main idea for the creation of the institute is uh, to focus on these commonalities and uh, take advantage of those to progress uh, all these different fields. And we will reconvene promptly at 4.05, thank you, uh, to Professor Schott and Tessulis, who gave our last session. Thank you.